Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Virology Live. Today, we are going to talk about transcription and RNA processing. So you may ask, what is transcription? You have probably a different view of it, I suppose. Uh, something to do with writing. However, today it has nothing to do with writing. So let's let's define what uh, transcription is. Here's our Baltimore scheme. mRNA in the middle, right? And our seven different genotypes <laughs> and genome types <laughs> arrayed around it. I suppose that that's all good uh, with you all, right? And transcription is this big red arrow here. It is the synthesis of mRNA from a DNA template. And not only is it a DNA template, but it is a double-stranded DNA template. Commit that to memory. Transcription can only happen on double-stranded DNA templates. So if you are a virus with a single-stranded DNA or a gapped DNA, classes 2 and 7, you have to make your genome double-stranded before it becomes mRNA. So that's transcription. I'm, I'm noticing in the chat someone said T, the person identified as T, where to sit. It's always interesting in a class, right, where you sit. And I, I miss teaching a class. Hopefully we will, we will do it in the spring semester. But many people come early and they take their seats. Some people always sit in the back. Some They always take the same seats. I do the same thing. And then there's some people who sit in front. I... I I have great respect for them. I think it takes some chutzpah to sit in the front. Um, and, but then as the first 10 minutes or so, people still come in, of course. Most of them tend to go around the sides of the room and walk up. But I have to tell you, one or two people will walk right in front of me as I'm talking. No qualms about that. I don't get it. I would never do that. I kind of think that's disrespectful. Not that I feel they're disrespecting me, but... Isn't that weird that you would walk right in front of a person giving a talk? I think one year I said hello to someone who walked in front of me. They didn't even notice. All right, so this is transcription. This is my definition of transcription. This is principles of virology definition of transcription. But you will find people saying transcription for other things, and they're just not Right. Take it from Mr. Pedantic. <laughs> Many people call the synthesis of mRNA safe from a negative strand RNA transcription or the synthesis of mRNA from real virus double-stranded RNA transcription. It's not right. It's not transcription. Transcription was originally defined as the synthesis of mRNA from double-stranded DNA templates. What is that called for real virus? It's mRNA synthesis. And so other virologists, my colleagues, will say I'm being pedantic. Fine, I wrote the book. I'm allowed to be pedantic. If you don't like it, use your own term, but not in my presence because I will correct you. Now, the, this transcription, of course, is what we do in our cells every second of our lives. We make mRNA from double-stranded DNA, and that, of course, happens in the nucleus, as you'll see momentarily. But many viruses do that as well. So today's lecture, in contrast, or today's session, in contrast to last session on Monday, is something that happens both in cells and uninfected cells and in virus-infected cells, whereas RNA synthesis from RNA templates is a unique RNA property, at least for long viral RNAs. All right, so... Uh, all these viruses in red here undergo transcription because they have double-stranded DNA in their reproduction cycles. Retroviruses produce a double-stranded DNA template from their RNA genome, and that's transcribed to mRNA. Parvoviruses 
make their DNA double-stranded. Actually, they don't do it. The cell does it for them conveniently, as you'll see. And the double-stranded DNA is transcribed. And the uh, hepatitis B virus gapped genome is repaired by the cell. These DNAs get in the nucleus, and the cell goes, no, it's broken. We have to fix it. <laughs> I think I'm channeling Wallace and Gromit, right? We have to fix it, and uh, they do. We will talk about that, I think, next week. We talk about DNA replication. And so adenoviruses, herpes, simplex, polyoma, papillomaviruses, hepatitis B virus, parvoviruses, and retroviruses have transcription as part of their reproduction cycles. All right, so that's what transcription is. Now, this is another key point that you should remember. Why? Because it is, is my uh, video choppy today? Let me know because if it is, I can reboot. Yeah, I see that it's a bit choppy. Um, let me reboot my switcher. I'll be back in a second. All right, looks smooth. Yeah, so we have uh, still some technical problems here at the incubator, which uh, we will solve because we are scientists and we can solve anything. Um, but if you do notice issues, please tell me. I've got the chat right here on my right, and I will fix it one day. We'll have someone here all the time to help me. As I was saying, here's one thing you need to know. Uh, if in cells infected with DNA viruses, at least one protein and sometimes more are needed for DNA replication. So when a DNA virus genome comes in the cell, no matter what DNA virus it is, at least one protein needs to be made in order for DNA replication to occur. And of course, DNA replication is needed to make more viruses, right? So from the smallest virus to the biggest, that's something in common. Transcription has to occur first to make that protein. However, not all DNA templates are ready for transcription, as you may know already. The single-stranded ones are not ready. The gapped ones are not ready. So they, they have to be dealt with, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But some DNA templates are ready. And here's an example of one that is ready, the genome of polyomaviruses. And so this includes viruses like SV40, which we will talk about quite a bit in this course, a small DNA virus whose capsid we've talked about. The genome is a circle of double-stranded DNA. It's one continuous circle. Very interesting genome, which we will talk more about. When that gets in the nucleus after infection, the virus is taken up by a caviolin-dependent endocytic pathway. It eventually, uh, the DNA eventually gets in the nucleus. It's ready for transcription, double-stranded. It's perfect. In fact, it's even wrapped around nucleosomes. We mentioned previously that in your cell, your DNA is wrapped around a number of proteins, including histones, to to form this nucleosome. Look, it looks like a cake with the DNA wrapped around it, a small cake. Uh, and this is a good way to regulate mRNA synthesis, as we will see today. Now, this DNA is unusual because in the particle, it's actually in, in the form of what's, what we call a mini chromosome. The DNA is wrapped around histones. Most viruses are not chromatinized, all right? Chromatinized is a word I will use. It is completely jargon. 
and most people on the street do not know what it means. I just love it. Chromatinization and chromatize. It means that the DNA is wrapped around proteins in the form of these cakes or, or histones. And uh, that's important because in the cell, big DNAs are compacted that way, so it keeps them organized, and it also regulates their transcription. So some viruses are ready, others are not. Let's talk about the ones that are not ready for transcription. So again, when a virus genome comes in, it needs to be transcribed. A DNA genome has to be transcribed because you need at least one protein to get any further, further in the reproduction cycle. And so if the genome is not ready, it has to be made ready. And here are three examples of viral genomes that are not ready for transcription. First of all, hepadenovirus genomes. These are circles of DNA, which, is, which are partially double-stranded. There's a gap where there's a single strand, and it's the negative strand. And then there's a piece of RNA attached to uh, one end. That's the green part here. There's also a protein stuck on the genome at another end of the, the DNA. This cannot be transcribed. And I want you to commit that to memory. Only double-stranded DNA is a substrate for transcription. If I ever meet you somewhere, the first thing I will ask you is, how many genome types are there? <laughs> and the second thing I will ask you is, what is the only substrate for transcription? And then after that, we can chat. No, I'm just kidding, but you get the point. Uh, so the, the hepatinovirus DNA has to be repaired. And in fact, this is done by the cell. When DNAs are in the nucleus, the cell is always monitoring them to make sure they're proper. And proper means double-stranded with no breaks. So if something like the hepatina genome comes in, does, the cell doesn't like this, and it repairs it. There are, there are a host of proteins in the nucleus of the cell that can recognize when a DNA is damaged, and they can fix it. So this hepatinovirus genome, hepatitis B virus genome, undergoes DNA repair, and it ends up as a double-stranded DNA. It's actually a circular double-stranded DNA, sort of like the polyomavirus genome. That can be now transcribed. Then we have the parvovirus genomes, which are single-stranded, and the cell looks at it and goes, I don't like single-stranded DNA, and it fixes it. <laughs> it fills in this gap and makes it double-stranded. The virus is, its machinery is not doing that, okay? Uh, the virus genome does not repair this. It's the cell that sees it as single-stranded. The virus cannot repair it because before it can, well, first of all, the genome doesn't encode a polymerase, but later on the virus DNA is reproduced with the help of a viral protein. Okay, and finally, retrovirus genomes are not ready for transcription. Why not? They're, they're RNA <laughs> in the particle, right? They have to be reverse transcribed and made into a double-stranded DNA. And then finally, that double-stranded DNA is integrated into the host cell genome, and then it can be transcribed. Not before, not as a circle. And this uh, integrated copy here in blue is surrounded by purple DNA, which is uh, showing you what the cell is. So that's the way these three genomes are made ready for transcription. So, all right, let's summarize. We have transcription is the production of mRNA from double-stranded DNA. It occurs with all of these viruses. And what we're going to do today is to talk about the process of transcription, the nuts and bolts, and then the fact that in many cases the transcription actually doesn't give you mRNA. It gives you a precursor to mRNA, which then must be processed further to get an mRNA, and hence the name of this session, Transcription and RNA Processing. Now, in our cells, uh, your, your cells and mine, we are, we are eukaryotes. That's a kind of a division of living things to indicate the presence of a nucleus. Eukaryotes have nuclei as opposed to prokaryotes, which don't, and eukaryotes are 
are more recent in evolution of Earth. So these are the eukaryotic enzymes that uh, make RNA from DNA. And there are three of them in us, Paul 1, 2, and 3. All of these initiate RNA synthesis de novo. They don't need a primer. Isn't that great? They don't need a primer. And so Paul 1 makes ribosomal RNA. Because we have to make ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes are made of protein and RNA, a bunch of uh, ribosomal RNAs, in fact. So this Paul 1 does that. As far as we know, no viral RNAs are made by Paul 1. Now, that's not the case for Paul 2 and 3. These are cell enzymes, but some viruses, are, these are utilized in their reproduction cycles. So Paul 2 is the enzyme that makes precursors to mRNA. So pre-mRNA is technically the way we should say uh, the process occurs because uh, in most cases the product is a precursor to what will finally be mRNA, and you'll see why that is in a moment. So Paul II makes pre-mRNA for both our cells and for many, many viruses. It also makes the primary microRNAs. We'll see later today that microRNAs are very small RNAs that are processed from primary precursors or transcripts, primary microRNAs, and then they're processed down to 21, 22 bases. They're very short. RNA Paul II also makes small nuclear uh, RNA. These are the RNAs that are attached to proteins in the nucleus, and today we'll see that they participate in splicing. And they also, Paul II also makes long non-coding RNA. What is that, you may ask? Well, long non-coding RNA uh, is um, a regulatory RNA. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> it doesn't go for anything. By the way, you may see that the slides blink every now and then. I, I can solve that problem, too. I have to unplug a cable and plug it back in. I'm not sure why that happens. Maybe we have defective hardware. So viral RNAs are made from by Paul II that include the pre-mRNA, primary microRNAs. In fact, the hepatitis delta virus genome, RNA, and mRNA are, are made by Paul II. That's interesting. That's an RNA virus. It's actually a satellite. It needs to be in the same cell as hepatitis B virus, yet its RNA genome is copied by Paul II. It's the only example of that we know of. We'll talk about that in its own session later on in this uh, course. And human herpes virus A polyadenylated nuclear RNAs, which are different from mRNAs, are made uh, from uh, by Paul II. All right, and then Paul III is responsible for the synthesis of precursors to tRNAs. They're important, right? The adapters for protein synthesis, uh, some ribosomal RNAs, and some small nuclear uh, RNAs. And viruses have, some viruses have Paul III in their reproduction cycles, including adenovirus, the VARNAs, which are immune antagonists, as we'll see later. Human Boca virus, <laughs> a, a small RNA. Every time I, I say Boca, I think of Florida, right? <laughs> it's not isolated in Florida. And then uh, murine herpes virus 68 uh, primary microRNAs. Now, you may say, why so specific? That's, these are the viruses that have been studied to find this, and it may be that other viruses uh, utilize Paul III for these purposes as well, but we simply haven't found out. All right. Um, now, another important factoid here. Only DNA viruses that reproduce in the cytoplasm encode an RNA polymerase like, like this, Paul II, typically. Because think of it, Paul II, all these enzymes, by the way, inhabit the nucleus. That's where they make ribosomal RNAs, tRNAs, mRNAs, etc. Paul one, two, II, and three are made in the cytoplasm, but they quickly go in the nucleus, and that's where they're catalytically active. So if you, if you are a virus that goes in the nucleus, you could, in theory, utilize Paul II and three. But many viruses do not go in the nucleus. As Rich Condit likes to say, they avoid the nuclear bureaucracy. I think that's fabulous. There is a lot of bureaucracy in the nucleus. It's kind of like going to Washington, D.C. Many people like to avoid it. 
So if you're a pox virus or a giant virus that stays in the cytoplasm, there's no way you're going to get access to Paul 2 and 3, right? So you have to make your own. It has to be encoded in your genome. But that's easy to figure out, right? Because if you just know that these polymerases, these cell polymerases are in the, sorry, in the nucleus, then if the virus is exclusively in the cytosol, it will um, need to encode its own. So by the way, I've, I figured out why I was losing my cursor. I woke up at 4 a.m. And I, and I had a ha-ha moment. These things bug me all night. You know, sometimes my, I lose my cursor. It turns out there's a setting in Keynote to keep the cursor on all the time. Duh. All right. Let's take a look at the process of transcription. There at the top is your double-stranded DNA. Blue is the plus strand, which is equivalent to mRNA, right? The, the light blue is the negative strand. And that red arrow is a promoter for transcription. That's another word that we will look at in a moment. A promoter is where transcription begins. And we usually show it as a red arrow. And the, the direction of the arrow indicates the direction of mRNA synthesis or transcription. Now, the transcription, to make mRNA, which is plus stranded, the polymerase is going to copy the minus strand, right? It's not going to copy the plus strand because... That would give it a negative sense mRNA, and that wouldn't work. It wouldn't be translated. So even though the top strand is the same sense as mRNA, it's not copied. The minus strand is copied. So the enzyme, Paul 2 binds to the template, initiates synthesis at the promoter. And we'll look at that process in some detail in a moment. And then it starts to make an mRNA shown in the light green there. And for the, by the way, for those of you that have questions, we're going to hit a pause. You know, we have a little quiz question, and I'll get to them. I'll get to all of them, so be patient. Don't be mad at me. I'm here for you. <laughs> so we make a little bit of mRNA, and then uh, that mRNA is capped. A cap group is put on, shown here as M7GPPPNP. And it's in a little blue box. That's our convention for a cap. We talked about caps last time because influenza virus polymerase steals them from the host cell. And exactly what they are, I will show you in a moment. And then eventually the polymerase makes the entire pre-mRNA. You know, it doesn't have to be the whole genome. It could be part of the genome. There are usually termination signals for it to stop. But it's a precursor for the most part. The... Most mRNAs are further processed, and we're going to talk about that today. So there are sequences that are removed, and they're called introns. I like that word, too, intron. It was made up, intervening sequence. It's a pink. It's, it's removed. And then what are left are the green sequences that code for protein, which are called exons. Not two Xs, just one. You know, it's different from the gas company. In fact, this was named Exxon before SO became Exxon. When I was a kid, all the gas stations were SO. And then suddenly they changed, and I got very upset. I didn't understand why they changed. But then when I went to Europe as a kid, they were still SO. It was funny. Anyway, exons are the parts of the mRNA that go for protein. Intron introns don't. They're removed by a process called splicing, which we will talk about today. And the other, so that's one of the processing steps of pre mRNA. The other is that the pre mRNA is usually cut or cleaved. So I will use the word cleavage to mean cutting. Uh, cleavage in biochemistry means cutting at either a protein or an RNA, okay? And that's what I mean. So this RNA is cleaved, and then poly A is actually added to it. And we'll talk about how that happens. And then the, the, the intron is removed by a process of splicing, which we'll talk about. And only then is do we have an mRNA. That's an mRNA. Everything else is a pre-mRNA, technically. So then that mRNA needs to be exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm because in the cytoplasm is where protein synthesis happens. The ribosomes will bind to it. And it will be translated into protein. 
And in fact, as you'll see today, splicing is needed for export. Splicing marks mRNAs for export. And then finally, when they get out in the cell, they're translated and eventually degraded. Now, mRNAs do not last forever, unlike <laughs> something to do with love, right? Herpes lasts forever, but love and mRNAs do not last forever. Um, and how long they last depends on uh, the, the function of the protein. So some mRNAs last minutes, some last hours, some can last days. And the, the de degradation of uh, mRNAs is controlled by sequences in the 5 and the 3 prime non-coding regions of the mRNA. Now, some viral genomes are made by transcription uh, in the nucleus, and they have introns. The introns are removed to make mRNAs for protein synthesis, but the viral genome actually needs to have <laughs> the intron in it. So some viral genomes are actually exported without being spliced. And you may say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just told me that splicing marks an mRNA for export. Yeah, I did most of the time, but some viral genomes and some cellular mRNAs can get out without splicing in a special way that we will talk about. In biology, pretty much there are always exceptions. You know, you know, in Pirates of the Caribbean, they said it's not really a rule, it's more of a guideline, right? Biology is a guideline. There are very few rules, you know. We thought there was DNA goes to RNA to protein. We thought that was a rule, and then reverse transcriptase showed us that RNA can go back to DNA. So they're more or less guidelines. All right, that's the overall scheme Let's talk about transcription now. Transcription is regulated very much so. It's, in fact, the way we make sure the right proteins are made in the right place at the right time. You don't want all genes transcribed and translated. You, you don't need it. I mean, think of cells that are not dividing, muscle cells or, or neurons. And, and most cells in your body, in fact, are not dividing. They don't need to have all the proteins that are involved in, in cell division, right? Not necessary. So they're turned off at the level of transcription. And the promoter and proximal sequences are involved in regulating transcription. So this is the anatomy of what we call a transcriptional control region. This is a DNA molecule with the dark and the light blue. And I have put different colors. To indicate different elements that are involved in the regulation of transcription. So here's our promoter in a red arrow. Uh, start site, I, I should say. It's really the start site of transcription. The promoter actually surrounds it, as you can see. Um, so that would be plus one of the mRNA there. But in fact, it's in the middle of what's shown in yellow here, an initiator sequence, which is a short sequence that is needed for uh, accurate starts uh, of the uh, mRNA. And then a little bit upstream is a Tata sequence, uh, which is a series of T's and A's, as you might guess from the name. And this particular sequence binds one of many proteins that are needed to regulate transcription. This protein is called TF2. T TF means transcription factor. 2D was the order in which it was discovered. And these two sequences, the Tata sequence and the initiator, constitute what we call the core promoter. You can, for many uh, genes, you can take this sequence alone and put it somewhere else, and it will it will specify transcription. It will not be regulated because it doesn't have all the regulatory elements, but it will specify uh, transcription. Let, let me unplug and unplug something so this doesn't flash anymore. Hold on. That's uh, the problem. I think the problem is the, the HDMI cable is plugged into a dongle. And, I, you know, the, the Mac only has one HDMI port. I have to get around that. Maybe I should plug the, yeah, the, the, the streamer into the Mac directly and plug my monitor into the dongle. <laughs> 
All right, so now we have uh, the, the core promoter. Then upstream, there are additional sequences. So the, this core promoter is 20 to 35 base pairs in length. It's pretty short. And then we have lo what are called local regulatory sequences, uh, typically 100 to 500 bases in length. And, and these bind different cell proteins that regulate transcription. There are many, many different proteins, and, and they bind specifically to sequences. So these are specific DNA sequences, each of which binds a different protein. <laughs> no, I don't have a computer virus, <laughs> but it's a good idea in a course like this. So the, the green binds one specific protein, the, the brown another, the orange another, all right? Those, and I'm not going to go into the details of, you know, which proteins uh, regulate which kinds of um, transcription. It's just too much for this course, but um, you will see some examples of this as we go by. So this this whole region now, the core and the local regulatory sequences, these are, this is the promoter. This is the promoter per se. And then finally, we can have distant regulatory sequences. And these can be anywhere from, you know, 100 to 10,000 bases away, actually. And they can still regulate activity at this promoter. And when uh, that happens, well, we'll see how that happens in a moment. So you have local promoter and its regulatory sequences, and you have distal and sequences. And they're called enhancers and silencers, these distal regulatory sequences. They're shown in purple here. The enhancers enhance transcription, and, of course, the silencers silence it, right? So here are some examples of uh, regulatory sequences in transcriptional control regions of three different promoters. At the top, we have the adenovirus type 2 major late promoter. Now, adenoviruses come in many what we call serotypes, right? Serotype is a, is a definition, an immunological definition. One serotype, if you're infected with it, we will make antibodies, will not protect you against infection with another serotype. So adenovirus 2 will not, ad, antibodies against ad2 will not protect you against infection with ad5, for example. So this is one of the many promoters of adenovirus. You're going to see more of them today. Uh, the uh, slides coming up, amazing arrangement. So here we have the, um, the transcription initiation site, the red arrow, and there, there's our uh, sequence, the, the, the yellow sequence that specifies accurate initiation. I call that the initiator sequence, right? And then there's our Tata box upstream in green. And then we have more further upstream two binding sites for two cell proteins called USF1 and CPF. You don't have to m know what these are, but USF <laughs> stands for upstream factor. It's a creative name. And CPF is actually cleavage and polyadenylation factor. Now, a, a, a word here about the word factor I hate it. It was used before we understood that these were proteins. Now that we know that they're, they're proteins, I think we should call them proteins, not factors. But people persist, and the names are stuck. So this is one of my pet peeves. If you don't know what it is that's regulating, yeah, call it a factor because it could be nucleic acid or protein or something else. So that's add two major late. Then we have the SV40 early protein. It actually has a few uh, transcription initiation sites. There's no, uh, there is no initiator sequence. Oh, we're blinking again, so I didn't solve the problem. Uh, maybe I'll swap the HDMIs at the break. I'll live dangerously. Uh, and it has a Tata sequence. And then it has many copies of a binding site for SPL, another protein that regulates transcription. At the bottom... Um, another adenovirus type 2 promoter, the adenovirus E2 early promoter. Uh, E2 is a region of the genome, which you'll learn more about today and Monday. We have multiple transcription start sites. We have a Tata sequence. And then we have uh, sites for E2F and ATF. Again, these are all different proteins that bind DNA sequences specifically. And here's a scale for you. This is about 100 base pairs here. So that's what these promoter regions look like. Now, how does transcription occur? The um, process is shown here just so that you get an overview. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but here's our DNA at the top, right? And there in yellow is our uh, 
promoter, which we've defined as having certain sequences in it. There's our mRNA start site. And here, <laughs> here's what has to happen to get mRNA. This big brown protein here is RNA polymerase 2. And these things on the left are all the initiation proteins that are needed to make mRNA. You don't just need the polymerase. You need a lot of other things. And they include TF2D, which is the protein that binds that Tata box sequence, and a whole lot of other proteins. This, these all assemble at the promoter and form what we call the core polymerase. So that is what's going to be enzymatically active. You need all those proteins to do to make mRNA. But as they assemble, initially, it's a closed initiation complex. It, it can't do anything. It just sits there until a step to make it an open complex, which f involves conformational changes that are energy dependent. They are accompanied by the hydrolysis of ATP, which, of course, gives us energy. So now the uh, polymerase can start polymerizing. It can copy the DNA and make mRNA. And, of course, that uses NTPs, uh, which it t puts into the enzyme and takes off two phosphates to catalyze synthesis of mRNA. Now, this uh, transcription process I is initially shaky, and, and the enzyme makes what are called abortive transcripts, uh, which means the enzyme goes 20 or 30 bases, and it stops, and the transcript falls off its junk until finally the enzyme gets going and it starts to make long mRNA. And why that happens is not clear. Uh, some people think it's because there's no primer and it's hard for the enzyme to get a grip <laughs> on the template and get going. Uh, so nevertheless, after a while, the, the enzyme does get going and it makes capped, precurs it makes capped precursors to uh, mRNAs. All right, now here on the right is a uh, figure that actually we just used yesterday on yesterday's TWIV. So we talked about how remdesivir works, uh, but we use the DNA dependent RNA polymerase instead of an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. But this is the polymerase in brown, and there's some accessory proteins shown, but not all of them for sure. But what's happening here uh, is that the RNA, the DNA template is coming in a channel in the polymerase. The strands are separated, and then the single strand runs by the uh, active site. Uh, actually, the, the, the DNA is coming in uh, from the right here, and the, um, the RNA is polymerized in the active site. And there's the RNA, which is shown in red. They don't use our conventions. Uh, and then the, uh, the RNA, there's an RNA exit channel, and there's the active site. The NTPs come in through another channel. Some of this should be familiar to you from our discussion of RNA polymerases last week. So that's what's happening inside this molecule. These structures, by the way, are all known. So let me show you about these enhancers and silencers that can work to regulate transcription up to 10,000 uh, base pairs away. Um, here's an example of an enhancer. So there is our uh, mRNA start site with the red, and underneath it you can see the initiator sequence. And here the RNA polymerase complex is bound, the Pol2 and brown, and all the accessory proteins. And this is an, an enhancer sequence which can be very far away, as you see. But what happens is the DNA is folding back, and there are proteins called enhancer binder pr binding proteins that uh, bind the enhancer sequence, which is shown in orange, and they can also bind one or more proteins in the polymerase. Here they're shown interacting with TF2D. Now what they do is they stabilize the polymerase complex and they enhance initiation. If you delete these enhancer binding regions for certain promoters, transcription goes down. So it's a way to enhance it. There are also silencers where instead of an enhancer, the, the interaction of the proteins which would help to cut down the amount of RNA synthesis made. So it can go either way. But that's how they work at a distance. Uh, now, so there, there are many proteins that regulate transcription. We've, we've talked about uh, proteins that bind DNA. So there are a whole host of host. <laughs> there are many host sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. I showed you some examples of them. But there are also virus sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, some of the viruses with larger genomes actually encode proteins that can regulate transcription because it needs to be done differently in a virus-infected cell from an uninfected cell. Uh, 
All right, so a whole, whole lot of these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, and I've showed you on the pictures DNA sequences in different colors that bind to specific proteins. So in other words, the protein recognizes a very specific DNA sequence and can bind to it. There are also a series of molecules involved in regulating transcription that do not bind DNA, but they can still regulate transcription. These are called co coactivating molecules. Now, the, the cell has these as well, but viruses often encode them. And the way they work, typically, or many of them, not all of them, they modulate the structure of what, are, what I'm calling nucleosomal templates. So here is what I mean by that. This is DNA wrapped around nucleosomes. These cakes are nucleosomes made up of proteins, including histones. And they give the DNA a structure. They compact it, but they also regulate transcription. And so these proteins, these histones in the cake can be methylated. In other words, a CH3 group can be added. They can be acetylated an acetyl group can be added. And that regulates transcription. And I'm going to show you uh, how that happens uh, in a bit. Now these sequence, so those are two kinds of proteins that regulate transcriptions. There are one that bind DNA, and then there are others that modify histones to make the chromatin or the DNA more or less accessible to the enzymes for transcription. And so the ones, the proteins that bind DNA have a modular organization. In other words, sequence-specific transcriptional activators, the proteins that bind DNA and regulate transcription, they can have a modular, they have a modular organization. So here's a schematic of a protein, the N-terminus and the C-terminus. These are chemically defined. There's an amino group at the N-terminus and a COOH group at the C-terminus. And the modules are shown in different colors. There's a DNA binding domain. It has a specific kind of protein or amino acid sequence that allows DNA binding. This could be any, it could be a zinc finger where certain amino acids, histidines, coordinate a zinc molecule, and that is good for binding DNA. It could be a helix turn helix. It could be a basic sequence. The point here is that this sequence can bind DNA, and you need that, of course, because this is going to bind the, the DNA, which is going to be transcribed. Then you have a part of the protein that is involved in dimer formation. Most of these activators work as dimers, and so uh, you, you have two proteins, and often what's called a leucine zipper is involved in allowing two proteins to interact. It's a great name, right? It's a series of leucines which allow two proteins to stick to each other. And it's a zipper, right? You can zip it or unzip it. Scientists can have creativity. And then there's an activation domain, which will probably interact with some part of the polymerase complex to help activate transcription. And if in the middle is a nuclear localization sequence, which we abbreviate as NLS. You need that because these proteins are made in the cytosol. All proteins are made in the cytosol. They have to be shipped in the nucleus to participate in transcription, so they need a nuclear localization signal. As we talked about before, proteins don't just diffuse into the nucleus. They're actively transported in by a series of proteins and through a nuclear pore complex, and you need a signal called an NLS in order to get in the nucleus. It's like a ticket. It's like a vaccine passport to get in the nucleus. Someone's asking, what's the relationship between nucleosomes and chromosomes? So chromosomes are big. They're made up of many, many nucleosomes with the DNA wrapped around it. So a nucleosome is a subpart of a chromosome. Time for a little break here. Let's take a quiz. First question, what is the first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses? Membrane fusion, transcription. DNA replication, protein synthesis, or all of the above. I'm going to plug and unplug, see if it stops the flashing, and then I will come back to the questions.
So let's see what we have here. Let's get to um, questions. And we got we have to go back quite a bit to start over. All right, that's the beginning of our class. My lagging, which we fixed. <laughs> When you, yeah. <laughs> Somebody's saying those slides are blurry. They shouldn't be. You know, I, I'm putting them through a streaming software, which may not be the best. I, I obviously have to experiment, right? And that's good, because that's what we do. Here we go. Is synthesis the same as replication? So I would say that um, replication is, is uh, copying of the nucleic acid. It could be DNA or RNA. So that obviously involves synthesis. So yes, but synthesis can also be protein. So when I say synthesis, you have to figure out the context of what I'm saying. Uh, if it's uh, replication, I'm meaning nucleic acid. And then when I say reproduction, I mean the whole cycle to make new viruses, okay? Is a primer like a polymerase? No, a primer is a small piece of nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, that hybridizes to the, the DNA or RNA template, and the polymerase then uses that to start. It's not an enzyme, it's a nucleic acid. And that was already answered, but <laughs> okay. Are all double-stranded DNA viruses immediately ready for transcription? That's a loaded question. Who knows all, right? There may be an exception out there. As far as we know, from what we know, yes, they're all ready for transcription. Does the core polymerase spin or does the DNA get wound up? <laughs> what keeps it from getting tangled? Wow, that's a great question. I'm gonna, I'll show you a movie. Uh, about that. There's some spinning involved, and it is, uh, it's mind-blowing. I'll show you a movie about how DNA replication occurs. Okay, so the nucleosomes and chromosomes, I explained that during the chat, okay? Does the leucine zipper create interference for herpes simplex? Well, it depends on the context, right? It could or it might or it might not. It really depends. Okay. So let's get back to the quiz. What do we have? Almost everyone answered now. Uh, the answer is transcription. The first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses. So... The uh, genome is ready. It just has to be made into mRNA because you need at least one, sometimes many proteins. So some people said membrane fusion. It's not really a biosynthetic event. Membrane fusion doesn't involve synthesis of anything new. DNA replication cannot occur until a protein is made. So by definition, you need to have mRNA synthesis. Protein synthesis, no. You need to make mRNA before you make protein, right? And that's a biosynthetic event, and it's not all of the above. Hope you you understand why. Now, uh, there are, this is a, a nice summary of the different strategies for uh, transcription of viral DNA. And we have two columns here. On the right is the virus example, and on the left is the origin of the transcriptional components. Where does this the stuff come from that's involved in transcription? And for some viruses, retroviruses with simple genomes, Colimoviruses, those are <laughs> plant uh, viruses, RNA viruses with reverse transcriptase, say circoviruses, single-stranded DNA viruses. It all comes from the host. 
the, the viral genome makes zero contribution to the transcriptional machinery. And then everybody else here, all the other viruses, um, well, sorry, I need to bold this to make it clear because I even confuse myself. Then we have an example of uh, the host supplies most of the proteins, but there's one viral protein that's made that participates in the regulation, right? I'm going to do that right now because every year I say I have to bold this, and I never do, so let's do it now. And here we have host plus one, and then this should be bolded, right, to keep it consistent, I suppose. All right. Uh, so then host plus one viral protein, bacteriophages, uh, the viral protein is involved in the transcription of the late genes. And then for all these viruses, the viral protein regulates transcription. We'll see some examples of that. And then finally, there's more than one viral protein uh, involved in these adeno herpes uh, viruses. And then, oh, the last category. I have to bold that one too, right? Yeah. Can you imagine I'm teaching this for 12 years and I still change? Of course, you have to. Everything is viral. What is that Lego movie? Everything is awesome, right? Everything is viral. <laughs> Mimi virus and pox viruses encode the entire transcriptional machinery. Polymerase, accessory proteins, regulatory proteins. Why? Because they're in the cytoplasm. They can't get access to the nuclear bureaucracy, okay? So that's a cool... That's a cool... Uh, Way to summarize that. All right, let's look at some regulation by now. We've, I've just told you some viral proteins function as regulatory agents in transcription. How does that work? Here are two different kinds of regulation that we um, look at. Cascade regulation. First, what does that mean? It's a cascade, right? Here we have uh, gene X being transcribed. It's a promoter. Start site for mRNA synthesis. This is carried out by cellular proteins. We make a viral mRNA. This is a viral genome on the top, right? Viral DNA. We make a viral mRNA. We make protein X. Then protein X actually is needed to activate another promoter on the same genome, the red promoter here, uh, to get gene Y transcribed and to make the, the mRNAs and eventually the proteins. So without protein X, Gene Y isn't transcribed. That's cascade regulation. We're going to see some examples of that today. Very cool. And then we have autoregulatory loops, which may be positive or negative. And here's an example of a positive one. We have a viral DNA with a gene. It's got a promoter in front of it. This DNA gets into the cell. It's transcribed by cellular proteins to make a viral mRNA. A protein is made, which then goes back to the promoter and enhances transcription even more. So you get many, many more mRNAs. So initially, the promoter works in the uninfected cell, but once you make a viral protein, you get better and better transcription. All right, so that's positive. Negative, you can imagine that the protein made eventually suppresses its own transcription. Why would that be, or what would the function of that be? Well, that would be to... Uh, suppress the synthesis of a protein that's only needed, say, early in infection. So let's go through a couple of viruses and see their transcriptional pro programs to illustrate this. So here's SV40, the virus with a double-stranded circular DNA genome. You're all infected with virus polyomaviruses like this one, okay? So this is not obscure, even though this is a monkey virus that is used as an example. Here's a timeline of time after infection. So infection begins at the left, the phase, the, inf the reproduction cycle of this virus is divided into two phases, an early phase and a late phase. In the early phase, the early promoter is active. This virus has its circular double-stranded DNA at the top here that labeled ORI. That stands for origin of replication. That's where DNA replication begins. We're going to talk about that Monday. But there's also promoters here that go in two directions in the early or late directions. And all that means is that in the early phase, only the early mRNAs are made and the late mRNAs are made in the late phase. So when this DNA gets in the cell, it goes in the nucleus. The early promoter is transcribed. The early mRNA encodes a protein called LT, large T antigen, which is 
I'll just refer it to T antigen, even though they're large, medium, and small for various polyomaviruses. And large T has so many functions. It's going to uh, turn on viral DNA synthesis, um, and the, the viral DNA synthesis is, a, is actually going to, it, well, it, it also turns on the late promoter. The, the activation of viral DNA synthesis results in the activation of the late promoter, and then you get late mRNAs made. It, LT has many, many functions, as you'll see. So it's a activator of DNA synthesis. It can also activate late promoters. It can also inhibit its own synthesis. So once we have enough LT, we don't need it anymore. It inhibits its own production. Uh, and so you may ask, what, what, what's the function of having two different phases? Well, the function is early on, um, there's no DNA. There's no viral DNA except what comes in. So there's no point in making capsid proteins yet. The capsid proteins are actually encoded by the late genes that are, in, that are encoded and produced from late mRNAs. So there's a period where only large T is made, that kicks viral DNA replication in. R virus DNA replication eventually leads to the turning on of the late genes, and then you can make capsid proteins. That's why it's regulated. Okay? How is the late promoter regulated is shown here. This is a very, very cool mechanism. So this is the late promoter, which is not on early when the virus first infects the cell. Only the early promoter is active, and that's shown in this graph. This is concentration versus time after infection. So you start at zero, and the viral genomes come in. They stay low for a while, and then they start to go up, and eventually you know, they peak. And when the gene viral genomes go up, the late RNA begins to go up, and from that we produce capsid proteins, and so the two can come together and make new virus particles. So the question, and, and in this uh, early region or early time, only the early mRNA is made. It's not shown on this graph. So what turns on the uh, late promoter? That's shown on the right here. So here is the viral DNA. It's come in the cell. Um, th this is the uh, this is the late promoter shown with the right arrow, and and. In the early phase of the infection, the E phase, the, the late promoter is inactive because there's a cell protein that binds uh, the regulatory sequences in this region, and they block transcription. This cell promoter is called IBP, initiator binding protein. It is a cell protein, yellow, binds all these regulatory sites, and that represses transcription from the late promoter. It's a cell protein. I'm saying it three times now because people get confused. It's not a viral protein. Now, what happens as DNA begins to replicate? T antigen is made first early. It turns on DNA replication, and you may be thinking, how does it do that? Well, we'll learn on Monday how it does that. And then as you get more and more genomes made, you titrate out the IBP. There's a fixed amount of IBP in the cell. And so the more genomes you make, the more viral genomes, there's now not enough IBP. And eventually you get DNA genomes with no IBP bound. And so the late promoter comes on and it starts to make late mRNAs. How brilliant is that? How brilliant is that, that the, uh, uh, the, the late a, a cell protein, its titration by DNA replication turns on the late promoter? I think that's very cool. Okay. So here's an overview of the entire reproduction cycle. To put this in perspective, the virus comes in the cell. The DNA is put into the nucleus. It's ready for transcription. The early mRNA only is made. That mRNA goes out in the cytoplasm. It codes for the T antigens. Those go back in the nucleus, and they stimulate DNA replication by a mechanism we'll talk about on Monday. So now you have new DNA made, and eventually titration of IBP allows the late promoter to become active. You make late mRNAs, which encode the, the capsid proteins. So now these capsid proteins can coalesce around the newly synthesized DNA, and you have new virus particles. And so the key here, why? what's the function of early and late phases? To delay synthesis of structural proteins 
until the DNA has been replicated, right? You don't need to have capsid proteins unless you have uh, DNA made. Okay, uh, slightly more complicated, adenovirus transcriptional regulation. We still have early and late phases as we did with SV40. Again, this is a timeline of the infectious cycle. But now we have an immediate early phase, right? It's earlier than early. So and then there, there are three viral proteins here that are governing phase transitions. And so in this uh, immediate early region are uh, the are genes among which encode the E1A proteins. E1A is made first. That promoter is recognized by the host cell transcription machinery. The others are not. The early and the late promoters don't work yet. But E1A is needed for uh, activation of the E promoter. You'll see the mechanism of that in a moment, how E1A turns on the E promoter. Uh, and then e, in the E promoter uh, is encoded genes, I'm sorry, in the E gene, which is turned on by E1A, uh, it are encoded proteins needed for DNA replication and the DNA polymerase, among other proteins as well. And then there's also a protein encoded in here, E2, that is required not only for DNA synthesis, but entry into the late phase. Uh, and part of that is by titration out of repressors, as we have seen, turns on D, uh, DNA, DNA replication, does turns that on and allows for synth, uh, synthesis of the late mRNAs and the late proteins. And the late proteins, of course, encode the capsid proteins. Now you have DNAs made, you can encapsidate them into new virus particles. And there's another protein here, 4A2, which also enhances late gene transcription. So three proteins govern the transition. E1A is initially made. It turns on the E region, mRNA synthesis, which turns on DNA replication, and that turns on the late phase, and then a late protein, 4A2, further enhances late transcription. Again, um, multiple phases. Now, let me show you how this E1A uh, protein, E1A proteins, they're multiple, uh, turn on um, transcription of the E gene, right? Now, in the cell are, th there's a set of transcription factors called E2Fs. They were originally discovered uh, through studies of adenovirus transcription. And so they're called the early region two factors, um, but uh, it turns out they're, of course, needed for cell proteins, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, these E2F proteins are complex with a second protein called DP1, which we don't have to worry about right here. So these, these are transcription factors needed for transcription of the adenovirus early region, okay? However, in, in most cells which are quiescent, uh, these proteins are bound by a cell protein called RB. RB stands for retinoblastoma. So RB binds this. And so even though E2F can bind a, a promoter, so let's say the early region promoter of adenovirus, the presence of RB will prevent transcription. And the reason is that the RB protein recruits another set of proteins called histone deacetylases, or HDACs. These enzymes remove acetyl groups from histones, okay? They remove acetyl groups, and so uh, that wraps the DNA more tightly. So here, there, this chromatin here on the right, they're the DNA wrapped around uh, our, our histones, our nucleosomes, which I refer to as cakes. When they're acetylated, when the histone is acetylated, the DNA is open and it's accessible to transcription. But when the acetyl groups are removed by histone deacetylases, these are cell proteins, then the chromatin becomes compacted. We call it closed chromatin, and this reduces transcription. So the presence of RB on the E2F brings in HDACs, which... Uh, close up this chromatin so the early region promoter doesn't work. That's where E1A comes in. E1A binds RB and takes it away 
from E2F. And now there's no more HDAC. The histones can be acetylated and the promoter can be active. This is just amazing. Can you imagine the years of work it took to figure this out? So the viral E1A is made first. No other promoter is active. And then E1A pulls off RB, activates the early region promoter, and then that turns on DNA synthesis. We will come back to this when we talk about viruses and cancer because this is involved in that. Here's a map of the adenovirus genome. Double-stranded DNA, about 35 to 40,000 bases. Pretty long. It has a protein uh, attached to the 5' prime end, which is part of the primer for DNA synthesis, as we'll see Monday. But there are multiple transcription units, which means sets of genes that are transcribed together. So here we have the early region transcription unit. That's transcribed first when the viral DNA gets into cells. We have the E1A protein, which we've just talked about. There's also E1B. Then we have um, another, we have an early region set of promoters are on the other strand. We have a E2, we have an E3, and an E4. These are all early regions. They're turned on by the E1A protein. And then we have late promoters. And you can see L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We also have a major late promoter, which makes a huge pre-mRNA uh, that encodes uh, mostly structural proteins, right? Hexon, penton base fiber. But look at the early region encodes the DNA polymerase and DNA binding protein. These are what gets DNA synthesis going. And then finally, the major late promoter is turned on after DNA synthesis begins. Really remarkably complicated. So here's an overview of this. Here is the adenovirus reproduction cycle with the immediate early, the early, and the late phases. We start with virus entering the cell, which we've talked about. The DNA ends up in the nucleus. The, e, the e, immediate early region is active. The promoter is active. So the E1A and E1B mRNA, mRNAs are made. The E1A protein is produced, goes back in the nucleus. It binds RB. It allows freeing up of the E2F transcription proteins. And now the transcription of the E2 promoter, the early region promoters can occur, not just D2 but others. And the proteins include the ones needed for DNA synthesis. So now we have onset of DNA synthesis, which is shown here by going from blue to red uh, DNA genomes. And that onset of DNA synthesis allows turning on of the late promoter, late mRNAs encode the structural proteins, which come back uh, into, this, into the nucleus and allow for assembly of new virus particles. So a carefully orchestrated series of events made to optimize materials so that early you only make uh, what is needed. The other point here is that these viral promoters are highly regulated. They're not recognized by the cell. So the E1A needs to kick all that into, into going forward. And the last virus transcriptional pro program um, is for herpes virus. And this is a, a little more complicated, but there's still three phases, immediate, early, early, and late, similar to adenovirus, but one twist that I think is really amazing. And that is the, even the immediate early promoter doesn't work in cells when the viral genome comes in. So we saw for the adenovirus genome, the immediate early promoter works, but here it doesn't. What to do? Well, <laughs> In the viral capsid, in the particle, this is a herpes virus particle. In this space between the nuclear capsid and the membrane, you see all this dark stuff. These are all proteins. And among those proteins is a protein called the VP16, which is a protein that allows recognition of the immediate early promoters of herpes viruses by the cell machinery. Without that VP16, virus is dead in the water. So now you turn on immediate early 
transcription because of VP16. Uh, some immediate early proteins like ICP0 are made that activate early promoters. Those produce mRNAs that encode replication proteins, and then DNA synthesis activates the late transcriptional units, which encode structural proteins. So very much similar to adenovirus, except for this twist of needing a viral particle-associated protein to turn on immediate early transcription. And so here is an overview of the herpes simplex reproduction cycle. This virus uh, fuses at the cell plasma membrane, and the nucleocapsid is transported down to the nucleus. Remember, it docks onto the nuclear pore, and the DNA exits through a portal. It actually then circularizes in the nucleus. We'll talk about this on Monday. But as this nucleocapsid is moving in, all those proteins in between the nucleocapsid and the, pla and the uh, envelope of the particle, they end up entering the cytosol, and VP16 is transported into the nucleus where it can activate the early, immediate early promoter. Those mRNAs go out into the cytosol. The proteins are made. They go back in the nucleus. They turn on the early region promoters. Uh, those proteins made uh, start the DNA synthesis procedure, and then DNA synthesis turns on the late promoter, which encodes the structural proteins. And here... Uh, I'm showing you this uh, DNA wrapped around a cake, which would be, uh, you know, it's, it is it um, is chromatinized. It's wrapped around histone proteins. This would be a nucleosome. Because most DNA, uh, when it gets in the nucleus, is immediately chromatinized by the host cell. So herpes DNA in the particle is not chromatinized. It's not wrapped around nucleosomes as it is for SV40. But as soon as the DNA gets in the nucleus, it's chromatinized. What's the function of that, you may ask? Well, that's a way of the cell from shutting down transcription of foreign DNA. And so viral genomes have to encode antagonists of that, and they, they most certainly do. So let us go to a quiz at this time. Number two, adenovirus E1A protein, stimulating the expression of E2, which then stimulates expression of 4A2, and L4 is an example of what? A negative autoregulatory loop, repression of gene expression, cascade regulation, or dimerization. And while you are chewing that over, let's take a look at some questions. I love your questions because, to me, the questions are just great challenge because they're all over the place. They're unexpected, and I like those challenges. Now, the real challenge is finding out where I ended up. Here we go. Thank you. I want to thank Aldan for your uh, contribution. I really appreciate it. Do all cell types have IBP? It's a good question. I don't know. Because without it, these viruses, uh, I think they would still reproduce because it would simply mean without IBP, the late genes would be on from the start. And so you'd make a lot of capsids which would end up being empty because there's no DNA in them, right? And so you'd have reduced infectivity. Yep. Can the cell uh, spot this foreign DNA floating before it gets a chance to get wrapped up? So the chromatinization is a way that the cell uses to repress transcription from foreign DNAs. But as I said, viral genomes have to antagonize that. There are a whole set of proteins encoded in viral genomes to antagonize chromatinization so they don't get shut off. What's the purpose of RB? So RB is actually a protein that is involved in regulating the division of cells. It's, it is a checkpoint protein, as we call it, because not all cells need to divide, and so this protein regulates that. We're going to talk about that when we talk about viruses causing cancer. It's just fascinating. Stay tuned. Please come back because it's really cool. If you lack RB gene, you will develop eye tumors, tumors of the retina. That's why it's called retinoblastoma protein, and it was discovered in kids. The retinoblasts are present early in life, and they develop tumors of those cells because this protein is missing because the cells keep dividing. But I don't want to give away the whole story yet. It's such a cool story. <laughs>
Does such sim similar regulation happen natively in host cells? Yes. So cells do all this regulation, but it was easier, way easier to figure it out in viruses, right? And that's why we, have, we know it, because viral genomes are pretty simple and easy to study. How, oh, this is a good one. How did T antigen end up with the name antigen? <laughs> it was discovered a long time ago using um, antibodies, right? And they called it an antigen because it was reacting with the antibody. But yes, it's a kind of a naive, naive name, but uh, it was actually in early days before people were using antibodies very much to identify proteins. So RB is a tumor suppressor, but also suppresses viral replication. Um, well, yes, it would not. The genome would not reproduce unless you got rid of RB because it's sitting on the E2F protein. That's right. What prevents the cellular machinery from recognizing? So the promoters are dependent on, say, E1A. <clears throat> In the case of herpes simplex, they're not recognized because. It's missing a factor, one of those proteins that's needed to keep the polymerase there, and that's what VP16 supplies. What's the advantage of having 16 as opposed to, like, E1A, right? You could just encode. Good question. It's another strategy to achieve the same purpose, to achieve a cascade regulation. How can the uh, E1A be synthesized when the chromatin is closed? Uh, seems a chicken and egg. So obviously it needs to be made quicker than the DNA can be chromatinized. It's a good question. Because, yeah, you can't make an antagonist before you get chromatinized. Um, but you can get a little bit of transcription, which is the cascade idea, right? So you wouldn't have all your transcription dependent on a little bit of leakage. So you get a little bit of E1A, and that's enough to then uh, turn on the transcription. Which type of virus causes cancer and how? Come back for the cancer lecture. About 20% of human cancers are virus-associated. Can RB be made in the lab? It, yeah, it could be, but um, it's you don't want to use a protein to be antiviral. It's just too big and cumbersome. Do cells chromatinize DNA in the form of cloning vectors or plasmids too? Yes. And in fact, uh, so 293 cells are really good at for putting in DNA and getting it transcribed, right? And part of it is has to do with chromatization, which dechromatinization, which I've totally forgotten now. I'll have to look it up for you. Um, it's a really good and in fact when I when I did a TWIV in Denmark. Look that one up. One of the one of the guests talked about why two nine three cells, which contain the E one A region, the early region of the adenovirus genome, why they're good at allowing plasmids to be expressed, it has something to do with chromatinization. Okay, that's a good one. That's I'll put that as the last here, so I can remember, and we will go back to quiz. What's the result now? Twenty of you dropped out. The answer is cascade regulation. You know, E1A stimulating E2, that which then turns on late. That's cascade regulation. It's not a negative regulatory. It's not repression. It's not dimerization. It's just cascade regulation. Straightforward there. All right. Uh, the, I, want, I promised I'd show you the cap on mRNA. Remember, the mRNA is synthesized in the nucleus, and very early on, the cap is added, and the cap is, is present all the way to the end, and it's needed for efficient translation. This is what a cap looks like. So here is base one of the RNA, right? There is your sugar uh, linked by a phosphodiester uh, bond to the second sugar, base two. Base one is the base, you know, A or G or C or U or T. And these are all five to three prime linkages, right? The five prime carbon, the three prime hydroxyl is linked to the five prime carbon. But the cap is backwards. The cap, here's the, here's the sugar, here's, here's a guanine base. Uh, it is linked in a five to five prime way. So the five prime here is linked to the five prime on the capping base. 
So it's not 5 to 3 prime, it's 5 to 5 prime, plus the three phosphates are still there. So that's why a cap is different. 5 prime, 5 prime linkage, three phosphates, and also it's methylated. So this nitrogen is methylated and, and these base 1 and 2, uh, the oxygen is methylated as well. So that's what a cap is. That's why it's unique. It's, it kind of protects the 5 prime end of the RNA and it, it allows efficient translation. And the capping occurs co-transcriptionally. Remember, the polymerase binds at the promoter with all its accessory proteins and it you know, does a lot of uh, abortive transcripts. And only after you get to 20 or 30 nucleotides is the cap added. And I think that's to avoid capping all those abortive transcripts. It would be a waste. And so there's a capping enzyme that uh, associates with the polymerase. Uh, once the polymerase goes a certain distance, it is phosphorylated. Two phosphates are added to the polymerase. That recruits the capping enzyme, which then puts the cap on. So cap is added co-transcriptionally, which means during the process of transcription. I need to talk about the, the other uh, processing aspects, which are cleavage and polyadenylation. And so let's talk about polyadenylation first. So the, you make a precursor to mRNA, which is longer than the final mRNA. And one of the reasons is that the three prime end is different, and th that these pre mRNAs are typically cleaved by enzymes and then polyadenylated. So the polymerase goes much farther than it needs to, and uh, this this is shown in detail on the right here. Here's a pre mRNA. There is a site within this mRNA called the poly A addition site. It is typically A A U A A A. And that is recognized by CPSF, uh, cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor, I believe it stands for. This is a cell protein that recognizes the poly A signal, will then cleave the RNA, recruits a couple of other proteins to do that. So now you've cut, and, and the right-hand part here is thrown out, don't need it. And then another enzyme comes in called poly A polymerase, which adds a bunch of A's to the three prime end. So you the polymerase makes a long precursor, it's cut at the poly A signal, and then poly A is added. And you add about 200 A's to typical mRNAs. So now we can talk about all the different ways to add poly A to viral RNAs. We have post-transcriptional ways that we've talked about today. Cleavage of a precursor to mRNA followed by polyadenylation. It's carried out by cellular enzymes and all these DNA viruses plus retroviruses uh, do that. And then we have polyadenylation during mRNA synthesis, which we talked about last time. Remember, reiterative copying at stretches of U in the template, that for flu and VSV, remember the enzyme stutters at a U sequence, and that's how it makes uh, poly A. So it's during mRNA synthesis. It's not after, as we just talked about. And then for some viruses, poliovirus, alpha viruses, they have long stretches of U in the minus strand and long stretches of A or poly A in the plus strand. So the viral RNA has a poly A at the three prime end. It's copied to make a negative strand, and all of that A is copied too to make U's, and then the U's are copied back. So it's simply uh, encoded in the genome. Now, splicing is another form of post-transcriptional processing in which these introns are removed. This was first discovered in adenovirus infected cells by two different group, uh, Richard Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor and Philip Sharp at MIT. They got the Nobel Prize for that in 1993. And the observation was that the adenovirus mRNA seemed to be synthesized first as long precursors in the nucleus. And then when they got out, they got shorter and people didn't understand what was going on. And so they didn't experiment which is illustrated here. Let me explain it to you. So they took adenovirus-infected cells and they purified hexon mRNA. Okay, you can do that from virus-infected cells. So here's the hexon RNA in green here. And then they took the viral DNA, shown here, it's a double-stranded DNA, they heated it to melt apart the two strands and they hybridized it to the mRNA. So the uh, 
mRNA is plus sense, and the, the minus strand of the DNA is then going to hybridize to the mRNA. And then they took this mixture and put it under an electron microscope and looked at it. And this on the right is the actual a tracing of the actual picture they showed, um, where the hexon mRNA was seemed to be hybridized with DNA, but there were parts near the, the five prime end that were big loops where the DNA was looped out. And there were three regions of looping, blue and orange and red. So apparently what happened was there was something in the DNA that was cut out of the mRNA to form the final mRNA. And that is splicing. You remove sequences in the primary mRNA transcript uh, in, in, to form splicing. And this particular hexon uh, mRNA is now known to be made from a, a precursor. So the DNA looks like this. The hexon coding region is this little short uh, DNA piece. And then there are uh, three introns that are removed by splicing. And these black sequences are then joined to the hexon body. The black sequences are actually non-coding regions, but they're still joined together to the body. Very important discovery since this has been found, of course, in many, many viruses, and our cellular genes are, are largely spliced as well. Splicing can happen in different ways, and uh, its regulation gives rise to different patterns of gene expression. So, for example, here is a mRNA with two introns, and they can both be removed by splicing to give you the final mRNA with three exons, one, two, three, that's called constitutive. You remove all the introns. Sometimes you can get alternative splicing. So this uh, five prime splice site can actually join down here and skip uh, the, this one. So you could get exon one, two, three, which would be constitutive, but then you could also get one and three. You could skip two. That's called alternative splicing. It can even get more granular. You can have alternative five prime splice sites and alternative three prime splice sites. So you could get uh, one and two and you could get uh, different forms because these alternative sites are spaced differently uh, here showing at the five prime and the three prime end. So this could be 10 or 20 bases apart and they could each splice to uh, a different part of two and you'd get slightly different proteins. Now, what happens in adenovirus takes advantage of this, and it's stunning. And here I'm showing you at the top the genome. And here's the major late mRNA, right? There are a number of late promoters, but there's one major late because it makes this huge primary mRNA. And that is processed to give rise to a whole lot of smaller mRNAs that encode different proteins. And the first thing that happens to this long mRNA is that there is poly A addition at one of five possible polyadenylation signals. There's one at here at L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. So each of these is now polyadenylated at a different site, and it's regulated by ways that are somewhat understood. And then these mRNAs can be alternatively spliced in a variety of ways, and some of those are shown here. And you can get different final uh, mRNAs that encode different proteins. And these are just some of the proteins here that can be made. And viral proteins can regulate this alternative splicing. So it gives you a lot of flexibility with a genome, which you may say, oh, we can only encode so many proteins. But actually, you could encode a lot more than you think you have. All right, let's do our um, final question here. Which statement about polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNAs is correct? A, it always occurs in the cytoplasm. B, it occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. C, poly-A is added at the 5' prime end of pre-mRNA. And D, it's specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. Let's go to our questions here. <laughs> it's the cap from host DNA. So the cap is just made from nucleotides that are floating around in the cell, right? GTP, for example, guanosine triphosphate, and it would just be grabbed by the capping enzyme. 
RNA is the key to life. Yeah, and it was here first, right? The RNA world. What will happen to mRNA if you take off the cap or the poly A? Multiple things. It'll probably degrade very quickly, um, and it won't be translated efficiently without a cap in poly A. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about this, and I'm I'm excited to tell you about it. That's right. That's the thing, and that's why I do this. That's why I do all this crazy stuff that few other professors do. <laughs> Answer the questions, folks. There's no more. Um, no more questions here. RNA was here first. Yeah. I'm very excited about uh, biology, and um, I, I want to explain it to folks who want to listen, and that's what you are. So thank you for coming. How many are here today? 140. That's pretty good. That's a good-sized class. But, of course, m many people watch the, the videos afterwards. Uh, what do we have? 1230? Okay. So no, no questions. Let's look at the results here. The, the answer is it occurs after cleavage of... Uh, pre-mRNA. Um, so it doesn't happen in the cytoplasm. It happens in the nucleus. It's not added at the five prime end, right? It's added at the three prime end. And um, it, it is, so the stretch of U is only for RNA viruses. This is a DNA virus mRNAs. So this is only for RNA viruses. Okay. Thank you for your contribution, Marge716. Really appreciate it. I didn't show the quiz when I explained the answers. Let me go back and do that. I'm sorry. I have to push the button. Which statement about polydentylation is correct? Uh, the answer is it occurs after cleavage of uh, pre-mRNA. The others, it's, it doesn't occur in the cytoplasm. It occurs in the nucleus. It's added to the three prime end, not the five prime end. And stretch of U only is for RNA viruses, right? The D, this specified uh, DNA viruses. All right, what's left today? Splicing marks mRNAs for nuclear export. So here's a pre-mRNA with an intron, and a whole lot of proteins bind to it in the nucleus to get it spliced. That's what all these little funny shapes are. And those proteins are recognized by the ex nuclear export pathway to get this mRNA out of the nucleus. So uh, there are a variety, NXT1, NFX1 are all nuclear proteins that shuttle things out of the nucleus. They bind to sequences on proteins. And so these splicing proteins are recognized by the nuclear export machinery, and that's how only mRNAs are exported. But as I told you, viruses sometimes have to export unspliced RNAs. So, for example, retroviral RNA is often spliced to give rise to mRNAs that produce the envelope protein, for example. But you have to uh, export some unspliced RNA because that's going to be packaged in new virus genomes. You don't want to remove this intervening sequence. So how does that work? Because as I just told you, splicing marks a genome, f an mRNA for export. Well, it turns out that the, g the retroviral genome has a sequence at the three prime end called CTE. CTE stands for constitutive transport element. And what do you think that does? Yeah, it binds the nuclear export proteins, NFX1 and NXT1. It fools them into thinking this is a spliced mRNA. Those are then recognized by the export machinery, and out goes this unspliced mRNA. How bloody cool is that? Uh, there is So that's one way to have a, a little sequence here in the genome. HIV has a twist on that. So here is the... Uh, HIV genome, it's integrated into the host cell DNA. Actually, it's the provirus. It's the integrated DNA copy of the RNA. And this is transcribed in the nucleus in a process we'll talk about 
uh, later when we talk about reverse transcription, you get a very long mRNA that's capped, and it's spliced to give you smaller mRNAs that go out and code for like different viral proteins. But you have to get the unspliced genome out because that's going to be what's packaged in virus particles. And so for HIV, there is a sequence at the 3' end called the RRE, which is stands for the Rev responsive element. And Rev is a protein that is produced by splicing of the genome in the cytoplasm. It comes back in the nucleus. It binds to the RRE. And that is what gets unspliced RNAs out because REV is then recognized by the nuclear export machinery. So two ways of accomplishing that. So in the end, splicing gives you value added. Some of you may be thinking, what's the function of splicing? It gives you value added. You can create different mRNAs and different proteins by alternative splicing. You can expand the coding information of a small DNA genome, and you can regulate DNA you can regulate gene expression by regulating the production of, say, transcription factors that are involved in specific genes. So splicing uh, really allows expansion of the coding capacity of a, of a genome. Another post-transcriptional modification is RNA editing. We mentioned this a while ago as an example of non-templated RNA synthesis. And the example I want to show you here is hepatitis delta virus. Uh, whose genome is an unusual minus strand circle. And this uh, minus strand is the, is copied by Paul II to make an mRNA, just one mRNA, that makes uh, a protein called small delta. There's a termination codon here, which stops the translation. However, there is what we call editing happening at this stop codon in the plus strand. So... This is now the plus strand, which has, instead of, a, of a, a U, uh, the UAG, it has, well, here's the UAG in the plus strand. I'm sorry. The, the negative strand has an AUC. This uh, A is edited by RNA deaminase. RNA deaminase is an enzyme that, that re removes amine nitrogen groups, so it converts this A to an inosine. Uh, and the inosine uh, will now, instead of base pairing with, as the A does with the U, during copying, it will now template as a as a G. So now you'll get uh, ACC, and that in the mRNA is UGG, which is a trip codon, a tryptophan codon. And that gives you a longer protein. There's now a stop codon dip further downstream. So that's RNA editing. You can change bases by enzymes like this and get different proteins made. It's very cool. Finally, I want to end about uh, today's chat about by talking about non-coding RNAs. It turns out that now, most of our genome is non-coding. We make a lot of non-coding RNAs. In fact, most human transcripts do not encode proteins. That is, most RNAs made from DNA in human cells don't encode proteins. And they're non-coding RNAs. Now, you know already that there are tRNAs and there are ribosomal RNAs that don't code for proteins. They just have structural and catalytic roles, right? But there are other kinds of non-coding RNAs that have been discovered in the last 10 years and have been classified into short and long non-coding RNAs just according to whether they're less than or greater than 200 bases. And they have regulatory functions. And in addition, viral genomes also make non-coding RNAs. And there are three kinds that I want to tell you about that are illustrated here. There are microRNAs, which are so-called because they're short, 21 bases long. Then there are long non-coding RNAs. They're more than 200 bases, but they don't code for any protein. They don't have an open reading frame. We make a remarkable large number of these. And then there are circular RNAs. These are single-stranded RNAs. They're circular and typically don't encode protein. All right, what's going on here? MicroRNAs are regulatory. Well, these are all regulatory. And microRNAs are made from primary transcripts produced by Paul II. So here is a primary microRNA transcript made in the nucleus. This is the nucleus of the cell. It is then chopped up by enzymes, Drosha and DGCR8, 
they cut up this to make a pre-microRNA, much shorter. It's about 22, 21, 22 basis longs, but it's double-stranded. It's then exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where it then is further processed and complex, so that this little hairpin at the right end is cut. Apparently, cells have scissors in the cytoplasm that cut these, and then now we have a double-stranded microRNA, with, and it's bound to a variety of um, other proteins, including Dicer and Argonaut. What great names, right? And then finally, one, the one strand is removed. What these do is they can inhibit mRNA activity. And so here is an mRNA that's in the process of being translated by ribosomes. If this little microRNA is complementary to this mRNA, it can bind to it. It will bring in all these other proteins, including argonaut and um, other cell proteins as well. It can lead to deadenylation, cleavage of the poly A sequence, and this uh, it can also cleave um, the mRNA itself. Uh, so argonaut has an act endonuclease activity that will cut up the mRNA. So can either directly suppress translation. This should be translational suppression, not not transitional, translational. And uh, it, or it can cleave the mRNA. So microRNAs can regulate gene expression by cleavage or, in this case, inhibiting translation. Uh, interestingly, there is a cellular liver-specific microRNA, it's called MIR-122, that is needed for hepatitis C virus re replication. And this microRNA is only in the liver. And that's why hepatitis C is a hepatotropic virus. This is the genome of hepatitis C virus. It's an envelope flavivirus, codes a polyprotein. The five prime end is highly structured. As you can see here, lots of stem loops. And MIR-122 actually base pairs with this very five prime uh, stem loop here. Two copies of MIR-122, they're shown in, in black here, base pair with the viral RNA. So that's stem loop one. And there's one copy of MIR-1 and a second copy. And this protects the RNA. Uh, from degradation and allows it to reproduce efficiently. And MIR-122 isn't found in other cells, and it's probably why the virus doesn't replicate outside the liver. In fact, in the lab, you can take a cell that can't be infected, that is non-permissive but susceptible to hepatitis C virus. You introduce MIR-122, and now the cells become permissive. And now you know why I wanted you to learn susceptible and permissive, because if you didn't, what I just said would make no sense. Here is a microRNA produced from the polyomavirus genome, SP40, double-stranded circular DNA genome with early and late transcripts. A pre-microRNA is cut out of the three prime end of the late transcript. It's processed to give you the single-stranded microRNAs. And it makes two, and they're perfectly complementary to sequences that encode large T down here. So we think this is made later in infection to repress large T when you don't need it anymore. So it's a regulatory RNA. Then we have long non-coding RNAs whose functions are just beginning to be elucidated. Wow, these are so cool. And this is a complicated slide, but they have multiple effects on different aspects of virus reproduction. So in this slide, the, the long non-coding RNAs are shown in green, and they have just the weirdest, most obscure names. Here's one called Enron. And this binds to a protein called NFAT, which is need for, <laughs> needed for transcription of HIV DNA. So this downregulates HIV transcription. Then we have a, uh, a long, long non-coding RNA called ACOD1. The, the production of ACOD1 is actually stimulated by virus infections. Sendivirus VSV stimulate the production of ACOD1. What ACOD1 does, it binds various proteins in the cell and reshapes the metabolic environment to allow increased reproduction of these viruses. Turns on the thermostat. We'll talk about that in a separate session. And here are some other 
long non-coding RNAs that do different things. These are interacting with genes of the innate immune response. And so the, these are uh, inhibiting the production of antiviral proteins. These IFITs are antiviral. Interferon gamma is antiviral. So their presence is increased by virus reproduction, and that leads to increased virus replication, influenza A virus and, and a uh, picornavirus. But we also have some long non-coding RNAs that are defensive. Uh, they increase the production of, of uh, immune proteins, in this case IRF7, a transcription factor for interferon, and that reduces the reproduction of certain viruses. So long non-coding RNAs can be turned on by viruses to benefit reproduction. The cell can make them to inhibit reproduction, and we are just beginning to learn how this all plays out. And finally, circular RNAs. Uh, these are amazingly produced by back splicing. Now, when we talked about splicing, we have a pre-mRNA with exons in colors, and then the introns, right, are in black. And so, uh, actually, sorry, <laughs> here the, <laughs> the introns are colored. And um, normally we would remove uh, the, the exons, Hold on, let, let me. I'm, I've confused myself. So, what is colored here? Um, we're removing introns, so the, the the introns are black. Okay. So normally we would go from exon one to two. We, we remove this first intron, right? We get one and two joined. But in back splicing, the the five prime donor is at the end of the intron rather than uh, of the exon rather than at the beginning. So normally you would have five to three prime splicing. And, and, and so in back splicing, you splice backwards and you end up with circular mRNAs because of the way that splicing occurs. All right, so in the end, back splicing gives you circular mRNAs or RNAs. What are they doing? There are tons of them, both in uninfected and virus-infected cells. People are trying to figure out what they do, but one of the ideas is that they're actually sponges for microRNAs. So what you, you may say is a sponge. Well, the microRNAs can hybridize to these circles by complementary sequences. So they could be storage depots for microRNAs, which could then be released uh, when they're needed. So they could be microRNAs, sponges for microRNAs that target particular mRNAs. They can also be sponges for RNA binding proteins. Remember, these are RNA molecules uh, produced by back splicing. So all sorts of uh, fascinating things you discover, and this is really a product of the genome sequence and the, the ability to sequence everything, and we discovered all of these, which we didn't know were there before. One more uh, uh, aspect of um, RNA modification processing, and this is a more recently discovered process, which is methylation of adenosine molecules on the N6 position. So here's an adenosine, right? It's a base. It has a sugar. It has the, the A base, the adenine. So the, the base plus the sugar is called adenosine. There's no triphosph There's no phosphates here. And um, the N6 is right up here. You can count the nitrogens if you want, but this is N6. And cells have a whole set of enzymes to methylate this N6. And some of those are shown here. To demethylate, to take off the methyl, to see if there's a methyl present, this, this, this protein here, for example. And, and, well, I just said to remove it. They're called... N6A writers, readers, and erasers. How cool is that? The writers add the methyl. The readers are proteins like this one that can say, yeah, there's a methyl here and have an outcome. Or no, there's no methyl here, so we're not going to do this. And the eraser takes it off. Another example of scientists being clever, which most people would say, oh, you're just nerds. But yeah, we are. But this is cool. Writers, readers, and erasers. It makes perfect sense. So here's an example of how this would work for hepatitis C virus. So uh, 
Hepatitis C virus is enveloped and it is assembled on the surface of lipid droplets that are formed in the cell. They're induced by virus infection. And this little blue protein is the, um, uh, the capsid protein of the virus, which ends up in the capsid there. You can see it. And the, the production of particles requires the interaction of the capsid protein, the blue capsid protein, with the viral RNA. Now, in some cells, the writers can put methyl groups on the mRNA, and that prevents the RNA from interacting with the capsid protein. So it blocks production of hepatitis C. So methylation of the hep C genome would block assembly and production of new virus particles. Uh, and probably that happens because the, these readers will bind to the methyl group and they will obscure its interaction with the capsid protein. And so this is just another example of how post-transcriptional processing, in this case methylation, uh, regulates uh, mRNAs and this is just exploding this field because they're, it's happening in virus genomes, it's happening in the cell, and there's an interplay. It's really amazing. So today we have talked about DNA genomes that are transcribed, and we've talked about post-transcriptional processing, and we've talked about the fact that only double-stranded DNA will give rise to uh, transcription. So the single-stranded genomes and the gap genomes have to be repaired. Nevertheless, all of these genomes here, circles, double or single-stranded gaps, uh, linear double-stranded, terminally joined double-stranded, they can all be transcribed once they're made to double-stranded DNA. Uh, and then the proteins, of course, eventually give rise to DNA replication, uh, which we will talk about next time, and uh, the synthesis of new particles. And so uh, on Monday, we'll start with viral DNA replication. So let me go back to our questions here, and here we go. <laughs> How is all this organized? <laughs> Remember, the cytoplasm is really crowded. Things don't diffuse. It's all The movement is all organized by microtubules, but we really don't know. All of this happens, and it's really crowded, and why things don't just crash, what a great, it's really not known. Is there such a thing as an outron as opposed to intron? Borrowed pieces of nucleotides from the environment? No. There's introns, intervening se sequences, and exons are the parts that are kept. Uh, but no, no, no outron. But it's an interesting word, right? Thank you, uh, John, for your contribution. I, I agree that viruses are cool. You're not a sycophant just by agreeing with it. It's a fact. I'm just the messenger, right? Oh, what happens to the splices? So I used to uh, teach about um, what happens to the splices, and I took all those slides out. I can actually show them here. I have one. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> Let me show you this. we will go back to the slides. What do I need for that super source? What happens to the splices? Look. No, this is not right. Oh, I have to not skip it. Sorry. Uh, unskip. Yeah. Here we go. So this is an RNA with an intron, and the exons are in green on either side. And all this splicing happens on a multi-protein complex. All right, so here the intron is shown with the two phosphodiesters at either end. There's a conserved A in all introns, 100% conserved. That A attacks the phosphodiester bond, releases one end, this, this free three prime end then attacks the other phosphodiester and forms a bond, so that joins the exons. And now you have this excised lariat intron because the, there's a phosphodiester between the five prime end and that A. Why is it a lariat? Cowboy rope, right? Looks just like it. Then that's degraded. <laughs> long, long answer to your question. It's degraded and reused. Good question, though. What happens to the splices? If the viral genome is integrated, does it need to worry about nuclear export? No, the DNA won't be, but the mRNA will be spliced. But if it's a retroviral 
DNA. You have to have unspliced mRNAs exported to make the genome, and that's where the, those two tricks come in that I told you about. Could you buy, make a protein to bind to Rev? So therapy with proteins is hard. It's hard to deliver them. It's hard to make them. The only ones that are good are vaccines. But to target Rev, you would use a small molecule. But you could do that, yes. Nobody has successfully. Thank you for uh, your contribution. Yeah, you'll learn more about retinoblastomas next time. Okay, But basically... When you lose RB, the cells keep dividing. They're no longer checked, and that's a recipe for cancer. Are lymphomas susceptible to HCV? I don't think so. It's, unless it has MIR-122. Unless it's a liver cell, it won't be, no. But it may be that it's reproducing in their... Oh, the instance of lymphomas goes up with hep C because... Um, yeah, so hep C is one of the tumor-inducing uh, viruses. Um, but, you know, as far as lymphoma goes, it's not clear what the mechanism would be. In the liver, it's continuous damage and regeneration of the liver. Thank you for your contribution, Kate. Really appreciate it. Is plasmid RNA similar to circular RNA? There's No, plasmid is a term for DNA only. The circular RNAs we talked about are single-stranded. Is backsplicing evolutionary for viruses? So, no, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't backsplice. And very few RNA viruses undergo splicing. Influenza virus is one of them, um, rheoviruses. But most RNA viruses do not splice. Yeah, so much for the picture of DNA to mRNA to protein. That's right. It's pretty... It's pretty um, diverse what's going on, right? How do readers indicate there's a methyl? They bind. These are proteins that have a binding cap, uh, a binding pocket where a methyl group fits in. And if there's a methyl, then they will attach to the mRNA, and then other things can happen. They could interact with other proteins. They could block the RNA from binding capsid, as we saw for hep C. They could lead to degradation. So it's just a start by binding to the methyl. Yeah, so here's a good explanation. Thank you, Zane. Methylation, the addition of a single carbon and three hydrogens to another molecule, and the removal is demethylation. Thank you. It's great. Is there anything more that's handy to know about viruses as related to mitochondrial DNA? Of course. There are viruses of mitochondria. <laughs> we'll talk about that more. I wonder if you could design a biological logical gate. Yeah, people have. The people at MIT have done this, definitely. They've done it using promoters and uh, transcriptional regulatory proteins. Yeah, I, I forgot who's doing it. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing, yes. Any way to design microRNAs to splice DNA in the correct places? So microRNAs target mRNAs. So you can't do it with DNA. Uh, here's a suggestion from Kate. Found a book, College Level Molecular Biology, an audible book, which could help. And of course, open source biology at MIT is also great, too. Yeah, there's a Q&A with A and V, and there's also a live stream Twivo today. I kind of overscheduled myself, but that's okay. Is there any immune uh, response in the nucleus yet yeah, to, to re recognize DNA? For sure. There are sensors of DNA. Silencing is a big one. We're going to talk about that when we talk about uh, immune responses for sure. Could these circular RNAs be used therapeutically? So, yes. In fact, there's already a circular, there's already not a circular, but a linear RNA used for hep C. So it's a complement of the MIR-122. It's called an antagomere. <laughs> right? 
and it binds MIR-122, and it blocks hep C replication. It's been tested in people. It works. But there are better drugs, unfortunately, so it's not used that much. Okay, so that's the end of your questions. It's now 1 o'clock. It is time to go. I hope you enjoyed today's um, Virology Live. Tuivo is at 4 p.m. Eastern. Q&A with A&V is at 8 p.m. tonight. And if you don't come, that's fine. Be safe. Have a good weekend. And um, see you on Monday. Bye-bye.